Welcome back to Minus 16, the podcast, well, the podcast that's going places. We seem to hit a rich vein last time, boys. So I'm yes. not trying to put the jinx on this, but the pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> and again, many of you I know are listening audio, but if you're watching, if you're watching, you'll see once again, we are joined by another guest. So we are global in the truest sense of the word this time. We've got Brad Colbell with us from this Ohio in the States. So your sort of breakfast time-ish we established around about nine o'clock as we record in the morning. Yep, that's right. And you've got Daniel, who by the time we finish this, will be into Saturday morning. Yes. Good luck with staying awake through the pod. If we notice you dripping off, we'll be there. And uh, I've got actually, a bright light on my face. <laughs> <laughs> Alex and I are still holding it up in the UK, but it gets confusing for us because our clocks change this weekend. Anyway, that's the introduction done. Brad has been kind enough to come on and we're going to talk about his journey. I think, Daniel, you reached out to Brad first, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I was very excited of like, I don't know, earlier this year when Brad just followed me on Twitter. I've been watching Brad videos for a while, so it was kind of a big deal. And then, you know, the last couple of weeks, the pod's kind of been going all right. And I thought, well, let's reach out to some guests. And I just messaged him on Twitter and he was kind enough to agree to come on. And now here he is in the flesh, virtually. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> and of course, your, your niche, Brad, is for creative professionals. So yeah. in, a, if, in a nutshell, if you're doing the elevator pitch, what's your channel actually all about? Yeah, so I'm reviewing tech and covering like the creative arts industry. So my videos are really geared, they're tech videos. So I'm reviewing things like iPads, Android tablets, and a lot of other stuff like Wacom tablets and tools that artists, creators, illustrators would use, um, a lot of monitors and things like that, drawing monitors. So anything that you can draw on, anything that comes with a pen is usually something I want to review. And is that, has your channel always been in that niche or did you kind of, as we all done over the course of time, refine kind of and migrate? Float, kind of find it. Uh, it started, I was a web designer and I was doing like just making content and just trying different things out. I think my first videos, like if you sort by oldest, my first couple of videos were about like the history of the internet. I had like the history of email, the history of Firefox, the history of this. And, uh, and then I did a review of a surface pro and that was like almost 10, that was over 10 years ago it was 10 years this past summer. That's kind of where I marked the start of the YouTube journey, the real start. Um, and that video just blew up and clearly there were people who were looking for reviews of tech of stuff that you could draw on. And this was before the iPad pro and the Apple pencil and all that fun stuff. So this was, it was the, the early surface was a really kind of revolutionary, the device in that way. Um, and so I just kept making content around that. And I'm, people wanted to know, can you draw on an iPad? Can you use a pen with an iPad? So I tried all these different horrible styluses, just terrible, like <laughs> Bluetooth styluses that just the pressure would kick in five seconds later, it was just awful stuff. And I reviewed them just to tell people they suck, don't use them. And I read the software for the iPad and then the Apple Pencil comes out and all of a sudden I have a real channel because Nobody was covering that stuff. No one was covering the software. No one was paying attention to it. And all of a sudden, there's just this huge influx of people coming in, just wondering, like, what is this all about? Kind of in the fall of 2015-ish, I think. That sounds like a long time ago. Uh, but yeah, it, it was just one of those things where I was in the right place, the right time, covering the right stuff, and no one else was there yet. And I just kind of... Mm found myself in this niche and I just chased it. I was like, this is more fun than working for a living. I'm going for it. <laughs> and of Amazing. course, you may be aware that on the channel here, we've got Daniel that is purely Samsung. Alex is all pretty much, covers all tech. I'm all Apple. over the place. <laughs> and then Brad, of course, I'm looking at your videos before you're coming on, you, you, you highlight and review Samsungs and iPads. I mean, so is there a, for an artist, is there a definite preference one or the other way? Is there or an advantage to both? Yeah, most artists geared towards Apple. And I think most creators have always been kind of in that Apple ecosystem more than the Windows ecosystem. And so I think there mm -hmm. was just this gravitational pull towards that early on. Um, but Samsung, the other thing was, is the Android drawing ecosystem, like a lot of the apps and things like that, has only really started to catch up in the last like three or four years. I think Samsung made a huge push. Um, I don't know how this went, but um, like some of the big drawing apps like Clip Studio Paint initially mm -hmm. came to Samsung tablets before they reached the wider Android ecosystem, which probably means Samsung was like, putting money in pockets to make that happen sort of a thing, which was really smart because they did that with several other apps as well. Um, and they kind of went in and built out that ecosystem. Now that ecosystem is much, much better. 
but it just took a long time to kind of get to the point we're at now. The thing that uh, for me, um, because obviously I worked for Samsung, I don't know if you knew that or not. Oh, I, I worked there for eight, eight years in Australia here. And part of my sort of job was to train people on how to use Samsung products or how to sell them and sort of guide them through things. And I actually stumbled upon your channel because of the fact you started reviewing Samsung and sort of drawing on Samsung. Cause that was a big question I used to get is, oh, what's the creativity process like? So that for me now, when I reflect back, I look at your channel and think, well, what a smart move to blend mobile products with creativity and drawing. Cause I imagine mm-hmm. at the start, there's not a lot of need to go down that route, especially with Samsung tablets, but to then bring that in, what was the catalyst for you to sort of introduce more mobile products hitting that other niche whilst maintaining your own sort of creative integrity? Yeah, I I think I started kind of pushing out away from Apple and away from other things because as a YouTuber, you just need stuff to cover. (laughs) Like Apple releases products on an iPad twice a year. If you're lucky, last year we got none. Uh, Mm. It was like a real drought. And so, and the other thing is the comment section. Like a lot of people will say, what about this? Can I draw on this? And then Samsung's products and Android products in general have just always been more inexpensive. The S Pen comes packed in. An Apple Pencil now costs 130, 140 bucks here in the States. Um, like that's a huge expense. Like even if you get the cheapest $350 iPad, you got to add another 100 bucks to that to, to make it usable. Galaxy Tab S6 Lite is $250 on Amazon right now. It's crazy. Like, um, so it was just a lot of people asking for it. And for me, it's always been follow the comments. If you're getting asked a bunch of questions, the same question over and over, it's like, that's a video, that's a video. And so it really was, I think what I learned early on in YouTube was follow what the audience has questions about. And that's one of the better ways to grow. So how mentioned. far in advance would you keep, sorry, David, no, no, videos fine, fine. planned in that way? Like, do you rely just on the comments or have you got stuff planned in the bank to sort of complement the two sort of ideas? I have a basically a big spreadsheet that I keep of like video ideas as they come to me. Cause I'll be on Twitter or X, I'll be on YouTube and I'll see something or I'll, yeah, being on YouTube. Another thing that gets me is uh, I'll see other creators like hit a topic and that topic will spike for them. You know, they, they're, they're used to getting 10,000 views and all of a sudden they have 40,000 views. And so I always have a document of things like, oh, there's more to mine here. There's more interest here than I originally thought. Um, but then the cadence is usually set by what's available. So this time of year, it's like stuff rolls into my office iPad rolls in and it's like, okay, let's book it as fast as we can to get an iPad video out. Galaxy Tab S10 came out a few weeks ago. Okay, let's move as fast as we can to get content around that. And then it's usually just kind of hit those at a regular cadence. Like when a big product comes in, you can usually milk it for two, three, maybe four videos, um, depending. So this time of year, it's like stuff comes in, you push it out. The summer, March, April is dead. So that's when you go and you're like, it's been six months since the galaxy tab came mm-hmm. out. Let's do a follow up, you know? And that's when you start pulling out all those old ideas and, or tutorials or, and then you guys love the business side of things. Oftentimes mm-hmm. you'll get a sponsor. Um, like I'm doing a video right now and the sponsor is Best Buy and Best Buy sent me a surface product to, to feature in this video. And uh, there's rules around like that sponsorship. Like it can't be an Apple video because it's the, like it, it's talking, I have to talk about the surface products. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's just a matter of like you get, you get a promotion. Like uh, I have this uh, surface tablet and then I have to think of what will work on my channel that will fit with that, that will make the sponsor happy because it can't be a review of another product. And so the video I'm doing for that is, I think it's going to be um, like five great Windows apps for beginners, right? Which fits in the channel. It works well. I can use the Surface to highlight those things. And so oftentimes with the content, it's just figuring out what works when you need it to work. And Alex, obviously, I've seen just before we recorded this, you put up a Samsung SE. Yeah. 
video. That's so I mean, you're yeah. obviously you're obviously used to working cross brands, both with the products you're actually talking about and with sponsors. I'm assuming what Brad was just talking about is something you've had to deal with as well, where you might want to make a video about an Apple device, but because of a sponsor, it's got to be tailored around their needs more than what you want to make a yeah, content on. Sometimes it's not a sponsor, right? Sometimes, it's, as Brad said, it's, it's about the, the timing. Um, if you know that a product is going on sale in October, in the case of you know, the FE, you know, you don't want to wait until November to, to talk about it. So as, as soon as that device landed, I think it was two days ago, I was already every five minute I had between meetings, I was recording stuff and just building that bit of B-roll. And then I think it was last night, actually, I was here until 2 a.m. <laughs> getting the video um, uploaded and scheduled for today. So yes. yeah, in, and in that case, it wasn't a, a sponsor driven one. It was more of a content and timing one. I'm not sure how it's doing, but um, I just thought I put it out there because my, you know, the previous, I mean, it been doing for four, five years and I've been making so many mistakes. I mean, Brad, I remember talking to you, Brad, when, when we were yeah. in the days of Clubhouse, right? <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, and um, yeah. So, kind of, still, kind of stumbling a, a, around and doing things, learning the the hard way sometimes. But that is the one thing that Brad said that I can definitely sympathize. Yeah, as soon as something is that is popular or it's is hot, right? Uh, just get the content out as quickly as possible. It's probably not the perfect video. I would love to have included lots more testing, lots more scenarios. I like to take the thing out and use it, but. You know, sometimes you've got to just be quicker, not perfect. Question, question for you three gents. Say we get something dropped like this week. We had the iPad mini, for instance. How crucial do you think it is for your channels that you get a, a content out that same day? Or do you think there's a case to argue where you can just let the wave ride a little bit and come in just a day or two later with maybe more chance of having relevant content and a chance of actually used it a little bit? How do you guys stand on that? Ooh, I... So from a view standpoint, my mini review went up Tuesday at the embargo time. And it's it's my number one video by far right now um, on my top 10 list. So like hitting that wave is huge. Um, there's There was with the iPad Pro back, uh, back in like May when that mm -hmm. came out, that was one where that, that embargo, I think was like noon on a Monday, our time, which was really weird for Apple. And... Um, they were rolling out the new pencil. And so none of the software was ready to take advantage of the pencil pro features. And on like Friday night, I got all these beta updates. Apple's like, here's a bunch of beta codes for a bunch of stuff like Adobe Fresco and Procreate. And there's some other stuff in there too. And so all of a sudden I had this beta software, but I had just spent three days working on this review. It was like 80% done, you know, like it was. And so all of a sudden I'm like, ripping stuff out. I'm working on the weekends and I was having trouble with the software. It was beta software. It was, things were just crashing. And it's like, is this the pencil? Is it the software? Is it the iPad? Is it the, and so finally Monday morning rolled around and especially with Apple products, if you say something is wrong, um, because I thought it may have been the pencil, um, but I wasn't sure. And I thought if I go live, at the embargo and say the Apple Pencil Pro, this new product is broken and I don't, <laughs> and I'm not a hundred percent sure, like that's going to take off like wildfire. Right. And I don't want to ever be the story. <laughs> I want to cover the story, you know? And so that was one of those situations where I had the review done. I talked about the issues I was having and then I was, it's Monday morning at like 8 AM. Yeah. You know, I've got a few hours to go. And I just, I was like, I'm scrapping the review. Like this is a this is a crappy review. Like it's it's incomplete. I don't know the answer to these questions. I'm asking more questions than I'm answering. And so instead I did, I took my unboxing footage and I just did like a quick five, six minute, like this is the new iPad Pro. These are my first impressions, you know? And I even said in that video, I was like, I'm dealing with beta software. I'm dealing with crashes and issues. And, you know, I, I actually wrote to my Apple PR person and I said, you know, these are the problems I'm having, you know, can you like, just so you know what's going on. And, uh, and I decided, you know, it's just not worth it. So I did the first impressions mm -hmm. video and then a week later or two weeks later, I ended up doing like a full, like giant 20 minute review. Um, so sometimes that deadline works against you because you only have a few days to do it and you just have incomplete information. And other times mm -hmm. with the iPad mini, 
everything was smooth sailing. It's an iPad. I've used a million of them. I knew what to expect. It was what I expected. So it just really depends on that product. It was the same iPad as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to, actually, talking embargoes, because I know, Daniel, you obviously get stuff from Samsung on embargo. Uh, and I think you've had some embargo goods as well, Alex. So I'm the only one that's going to say, how, how far in advance, I, I'm assuming you guys are allowed to say, how far in advance of release day do you get those goods to begin actually getting hands on with and playing with? Uh... Daniel, yeah, it depends on who we got your contact today? is. You're on mute, mate. Oh, no, I'm not. Yeah. Can you hear me? There we go. Yes, now. There we go. Okay. It depends on who the person is that is my contact at the time, whether they're there or whether they're not there, because I have contacts in Samsung that probably other people might not, so they might organize and shift things around for me a bit earlier than potentially allowed. When I worked there, it was like two months in advance I would – have stuff but obviously i don't have that anymore but now it could be like maybe a week ahead um learning about the stuff could be a bit longer maybe like a month um but if their embargoes are pretty tight but the thing is with samsung's embargoes is once the embargo date is over there is no restrictions at least from what i've gathered on what you can say how you can say it they don't follow up to say hey is there's an issue let us know they just they just let you go and that, that's pretty much all I've sort of had. But I think for me, the lead in time and my lead in time afterwards is embargo is not my most important day. Like I would do a hands-on video on embargo day and it might do like 10,000 views. My videos and my views come later. Like the mm. three months afterwards, I'll be still getting views on the S24 Ultra because I know where to look. I know the updates. I know things to find. And I kind of can make it stretch out like good mozzarella cheese um, with, the, with the device launched like that. But yeah, yeah, probably about a week is when the hands-on will get will get given. I think sometimes, I mean, I, I've only been, I think it was only this year that I had a couple of embargoes in that they weren't great. I mean, as Dan suggested, right, that's, there, sometimes you get the brand itself reaching out and go, taking you through, you know, about the product, you know, what to expect and everything, which is great. Oftentimes, in my experience, you, you get a few days, literally the week before maybe, and it's all rushed. I mean, I think the Samsung one that I had here in the UK, um, it wasn't until the midnight, the day before launching one of the products. It was, it was just a mon- uh, like a gaming monitor. But the midnight before launch date, I was getting information that should be in the video. So like Brad, I just decided not to mention it, not to talk about that feature, and then do have another review later with you know, when things were working, because it's just, there's so, so many risks, right? Because you're, is your face, is your brand effectively. And if you say something that is, is in, inaccurate, you're just going to, you know, you're just going to look silly. Um, but I, I think um, in some, I, I found, I think it was a Sony Xperia 1 Mark 6 this year. Sometimes, you know, if you, if you follow the right people and you uh, uh, kind of find out when the embargo is, you might find that, Sometimes it's available in the shops the same day as the embargo. Hmm. And in, in that case, I, there weren't many videos ready for embargo. So my video went up pretty much the same time or maybe with, within a day of the embargo. And it did really well. It's still doing really well. And I think sometimes we kind of get this illusion that the embargo is the thing that we should be chasing. And sometimes actually just find out when the product is launched and, and get it yourself um, might be worth it. And with, with Apple, Brad, what's their protocol and processes? When they supply it, is there any ring fencing around what you can say? Do they steer you in directions or is it completely your take on the product? So usually it's completely my take on the product. So they're, they're not steering in any way. Um, but usually there's they announce it um, and then the, the next day there's like um, – They'll bring in a bunch of reviewers. There's usually like six of us on a call, kind of like this, just a Zoom call or something. And they'll just walk you through it and they'll walk mm-hmm. through the new features. So for the mini, they did a lot of stuff with all their new AI features where they're showing us how to use the calculator app and how to use like the notes app and stuff like that. Um, so they are, they're definitely highlighting features for us and they're trying to make like the new stuff known. But most of the time with a lot of that, I kind of ignore it because I know what I want to cover and I know what my audience wants to hear about. 
um, especially with the AI stuff. My audience hates AI, generative AI in general. Illustrators hate it. Uh, so I wonder it's like, why I'm that not... would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah, like I know what I'm going to talk about and what I'm not going to talk about, what I'm going to breeze over. Um, and But they've never had a problem with me like they were really pushing their app freeform a couple of years ago, which is Excellent. like this note taking app, like whiteboarding app type thing. And uh, they really pushed that hard. I think there were two times where I was on calls with them where they were talking about it and I never covered it as its own video. I think they really wanted me to, but I was like, it just doesn't quite fit my audience. Like there's better stuff out there. Um, I never covered it and I never, took any flack for it and they still talk to me. So yeah, they're never really putting their finger on the scale. Uh, I'm guessing with, that, mm, oh, sorry, I was just going to mention, following off on that, just briefly Dan, sorry, with, with Max, that's really not your audience's target, right? So I believe there's a hands-on in the States this Monday, isn't there, from what I'm understanding? But it's oh, a, very there? much okay. a Mac-driven event. I think so, yeah. From what I saw yesterday on Twitter and from, well, fun, fun enough, Dan on Mac Rumors was mentioning it as well last night. I think there's a hands-on with the new Macs on Monday. And then, of course, they've got more Apple intelligence coming out next week. Um, and it's their financial results as well. So it's quite a, a, a week of Apple news next week. But I didn't know if you, you're you not going to the hands-on then, clearly. Nope, nope. I only get iPad stuff, which is kind of interesting because I'll be told... Like before the mini dropped, I was told several days ahead of time, are you available for for um, that? Like they blocked in my schedule for the day after the mini was announced um, to talk about something. And I'm like, well, they only tell me about iPad. So I know it's going to be an iPad. So when the rest of the world is like chasing rumors and stuff like this, I'm like, I know an iPad's coming out <laughs> Tuesday. Like, I don't know when, I don't know how, but I know it's coming. So... Yeah, sorry. I was curious, yeah. like you mentioned about you've got an Apple PR person. At what point in your YouTube journey does that happen? Yeah. Like, that's when, kind of when, does, when do you get to that point? And when that happens, are you like, I'm, I've made it. Like I can just sit back, <laughs> smoke my yeah. cigar, sip my whiskey and be like, I'm, I've made it. I'm, I'm a YouTuber. Yeah. That was for me about four years ago. I think it was 2020. That was a lot of stuff happened in 2020. Uh, yeah. like once the pandemic <laughs> hit, like I, I was freaking out because I had just kind of gotten to the point where YouTube was stable. Um, 2019, I had kind of taken a risk and I had, that was the year I transitioned from doing freelance work, like graphic design, web design, UX design into YouTube full time. And it was a really tenuous year. Like there were some months where I didn't cover my costs. There was other months where I made more. And so you tried to kind of even things out. Uh, and I was always like, if I could just like get through this, if I could just produce more content and have more time, uh, I could build this audience. So 2019 was that year for me. And I just like got to that point where I like as an emergency pull an emergency kind of lever was I could take a freelance job. Right. But I never needed to do that, yeah. but I came close and you know, in 2020, I was like, okay, now I think I can make a living at this. I'm, I'm not going to sweat it so much. And then March hit and everybody was stuck at home. And, and I'm like, oh no, the economy's tanking. This is it for me. Like, I can't even get a freelance job now anymore. And then people started, they were stuck at home watching videos and they were taking, they were learning to draw. And they were, so it was like, mm. I tripled overnight. And Whoa. it was around that time that Apple rolled out their new iPad pros. I think it was. And so they reached out to me because my channel was blowing up and Apple reached out. So for me, it was very much a moment of like <laughs> the sipping the whiskey, you know, smoking cigars. <laughs> like I could point to it. It's an April and May of 2020 when the rest of the world was going to pot. I was having a great time. Um, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I just couldn't talk about how good it was for me. Uh, so, and, uh, Alex, I mean, you started your channel in 2020 because this is something yeah, we briefly yeah. touched on I think very briefly a, a, a while back it was, was hitting that mark. I wasn't smart enough to realize that that would have been a great time, as you just said, Brad, because everyone's stuck at home. So Alex, you, you started your channel then. Did you see rapid growth in 2020? Was your channel still too I young? I kind of missed the first wave in 2020. I mean, I wish I had started. I mean, I, I messed around with YouTube. I created, a, a, I think it was a football channel, uh, soccer in America. Uh, yeah, just to kind of get used to it. And because I had this idea of, of the channel, but not brave enough to start. And it's one of those things that we always talk about, right? Sometimes just like get the videos out. So I missed the first wave of the iPad. I mean, it would have been great for the channel. 
but yeah, it's still it was still a great year to start. Um, yeah, and I think it was the year of of Clubhouse as well. And we were, yep. so we we're talking a lot with other creators, sharing a lot of information. It was great um, from a starting out creator at the time. It, it was very rich in terms of what was out there and everyone trying to, and I remember, <laughs> um, talking to Sagi as well, who I think mm -hmm. we, we've all talked to her before. And yeah. he's, he also lives near, in Cleveland. Near, oh, does that's he? That's right. Yeah. 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 But yeah. So it's, it's, it was a great time to start. Um, but I think I just missed that, that first wave in April, March, April, 2020, because that was when it was really at its peak. Mm -hmm. So your channel actually started obviously a long way before that, didn't it, Brad? You, you yeah, 2015, 2014, 2015, 2014 is when I kind of June of 2014 is when I kind of peg as my I became a YouTuber sort of time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I but I posted inconsistently and it was just kind of this, you know, up and down sort of thing. And then it was the fall of 2015 because the Apple uh, the the iPad Pro came out. And there was a new Surface, and it was just there was a lot to talk about. And all of a sudden, I like that's when things really just kind of blew up as weird because it wasn't like huge, you know. It, it's like any any YouTube channel kind of ebbs and flows, but it was that first peak, you know. Uh, talking well, about blowing up, I mean, not many people know this, and I think I found you first through your other channel, your yeah. uh, Brad's Art School channel. Yeah. Um, which one came first though? Did you create that as a, as an outlet first or did you have that as a, okay, this content doesn't fit my tech review sort of style. That's I'll, exactly I'll it. This. So early in YouTube, it was just, I'll make art content. Some of it is reviews. Some of it is tutorials and the algorithm likes consistency and it kind of makes sense. So if someone mm. comes in because they see an iPad review or a Samsung review, they're into tech and then I publish an art tutorial, they're going to be like, oh yeah, I'm not into that video. I'll wait for the next one. Right. And so the algorithm serves the video to a handful of your, like a, a chunk of your base, like the most passionate people who click on all your videos, right? Those are the first people it serves it to. And if a large section of that audience isn't interested, the algorithm isn't going to continue to promote it. Like, so it kind of tamps down on the video's potential. But what I found with tutorials and lessons and educational stuff is it's evergreen, unlike tech, which once the new product comes out, the old videos, you know, go down. But these are like people still watch like tutorials I did a decade ago. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to do that. I also sell online courses and those tutorials are much better at selling online courses than the tech videos are. And so it was one of those things. And so I started in the in January of 2021, actually, probably around the time I met you because I was jumping on Clubhouse at the time. Yeah, which was, we should talk about that because that was I had never talked to another YouTuber. I didn't know how to talk to other wild. YouTubers other than like yeah. in the comment section until yeah. that time and how much I grew just in those like three or four months. Um, yeah, but I started that channel for art tutorials specifically. And I had a theory that if because it's basically like a, a cartoon and an art tutorial mm. kind of mushed together. So there's a story mm. to each one and you kind of follow this goofy character played by me. And my daughter got to voice one of the kids in the, in the school. It's and so everything. Funny, actually. Yeah. I, I love that stuff. And they were fun to do. They're, they're just too much work. Um, I imagine. In yeah. fact, this is a tangent, but uh, someone reached out to me a few, about a month ago because I have not published a, a video on that channel in over a year. It was like the summer of last year. So someone reached out from like some holding company that buys YouTube channels. And they said, would you be willing to sell it? And I thought, oh, well, maybe, the right you, you know, like, <laughs> so, so of course the first thing going through my head is like, give me a number. Like, what's the number? What are we talking here? Like, yeah. like, is it $5,000? Cause no, is it $50,000? Maybe, you know, is it 500,000? Let's go. Like, you know, <laughs> and so all I wanted was a number. And so we've been, so my first thought was to write them. And then I was like, no, I should go through my rep who handles all my brand deals because they negotiate and they have lawyers and they like, They've saved my bacon so many times, even though they do take a cut of all the deals, but it's totally worth it for me personally, mm. just because of having those lawyers and knowing how those deals are structured and knowing how to do all that stuff. 
And so I thought selling a channel sounds like a big deal. So mm. like I went through him to sound more professional. And so we keep going back and forth and they want more information. First, they wanted like metrics and they wanted me to export stuff from YouTube studio. And now we're at the point where I actually gave them access to it so they could get the data pulled down. So I, I'm a month in, I still don't have a number. All I wanted from these people was like a ballpark. <laughs> what are we talking before we get into the weeds? I'm like 90% sure I'm going to say no, but I want the number. You know, I really want to know, like, what you is this know, process yeah. like? Yeah. I had a joke. Speaking, speaking of blowing up, here's a note seven. Um, but that was all I really wanted to, <laughs> to say. Um, I had it sitting. I'm like, oh, there's a joke there. And then anyway, keep going. <laughs> Which possibly at that point of the conversation, sort of what Brad is talking about getting to a channel, which is possibly, you know, you're going to be sold, monetized in that way, channel growth, channel sustainability. And, and Daniel and Alex are in the group in the intervening two weeks, there's been a lot of conversation about channels growing very, very rapidly, at least from a point of view of subscribers. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the four of us sitting here have all taken the line of we want organic, genuine viewers. We want to have an engaged audience, people that feel compelled to want to watch us. It's quite clear out there though, that there's a lot of people taking a route very different to that. And it's just all about having numbers on the screen to appeal to sponsors. I'm gonna kind of sit back a bit at this point because it's not something that I'm brilliantly well versed on, but I think the three of you probably have got far better knowledge on it. So I guess, Alex, do you wanna sort of kick yeah. off with? Just a bit of a recap, right, for people who haven't watched our previous episodes before, but just a bit, this has been highlighted in the last year. It's probably been going on for longer than that, but it came to our attention about a year ago and we, I did a couple of tests on what, what can this thing do and very quickly realized that by, you know, artificially boosting a video, YouTube, I don't know how or, you know, what the process is, but you will get some results, whether you like it or not. So it's almost like, you know, you could say it's pay to play in a way, but it, it's it probably not that nefarious or, or, or malignous, but I think it's um, or malicious, but I think there's a mechanism in YouTube that allows people of channels of any size to, to pay for, for an ad. And there are multiple ways of doing this either via YouTube promotions uh, in, in, in the YouTube studio or via Google ads. So you can create an ad account and, and, and promote your video as if it was a, you know, selling cakes, whatever, as a product. And some people found that actually you can not just boost views, but also boost subscribers. And we had a great example. It was actually a, a huge discussion on Twitter that got quite unhealthy in a way, because, yeah. you know, people were trying to understand, you know, how this person got to that point. And, you know, it got quite, quite vicious in a way, the conversation, but the bottom line is, you know, this one creator is just an example. There are so many that we were finding that are from, from 20,000 subscribers one day to a month later, you know, pass, passing a hundred thousand just by spending a few hundred extra dollars on, on their, on their videos, which, which kind of dilutes the hard work and, you know, the, because a lot of brands uh, will look at the number instead of looking at the engagement from the audience and looking at the, uh, you know, the history of the channel and seeing how engaged that audience is. And I'm finding, I think this week I actually got, got quite upset about one incident where a brand, mm. a big brand, I won't mention who they are, but it's the second time they reached. Um, so the first time they reached me was for the Brazilian channel, actually. And it didn't work out and I never really followed up, but I noticed that they've, they've chosen other creators and, at that time, I remember thinking, you know, what's different? And the difference was the number of views, regular views that they get on their channels. But when you look at, there's this website called View Stats that anyone can look at. I think uh, it was created by Mr. Beast. And you can see a, a video doing this massive spike and then flat lines, which is a, a great sort of indication that the, view, the video is being boosted either by the creator itself. And I forgot to mention that the brands themselves can boost your video with your permission hopefully but i had an incident that i actually had to delete a video because the brand boosted my video without my permission <laughs> it's like that's a no-no for me and it's you never know how they're boosting how they're you know is it chinese bots is it 
uh, legit or you know how are they doing this and you, you just don't want it um but the the subscriber boost and the, and the view boost you know and, and this just adds up to to the fact that this week or earlier yeah earlier this week a brand reached out same thing i gave him my number and it's the same number i give to any brands this is how much i charge for um as a kind of a sponsored slot for a dedicated video i usually offer a package as well if because you, you know ideally you want to sell more than just one one thing so you can work on now, paper like is a great example of that that you you kind of work on multiple um mo multiple slots different formats but yeah this this brand came back and said yeah no your your cpm which is a cost per thousand uh, it was too high too high and i said well i don't really calculate my engagements on views but you know w can you give me an example of what would be a, a decent one so they forwarded me a video and it was one of those channels that we've we've been discussing offline, and there's no point kind of it it's 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 spreading throughout the entire YouTube. So you know, there's no specific channel that we should mention here. Um, but it was one of those, and and I just I had to pretty much educate the brand in a way and say, look, this is why your your CPM is low for that for that creator. But if you look at the ratio of views to comments and views to likes, it's clearly um, you know, bots or, or views that are being shown to people on as a, as a skippable ad, perhaps, you know, when you go on YouTube, sometimes you can't, you know, you're forced to watch, um, a few seconds and that, that counts as a view. And, but, you know, as a brand, you, you probably, or you're definitely not getting the return on investment on that view because the person is skipped before, way before the creator got to your, to your sponsored slot. So, um, yeah, so the, the some brands are actually coming back to to me and saying thank you so much for highlighting this and i think it's up to us creators really when that happens right and if we if we feel comfortable with it to yeah to educate the brands without calling people out specifically but to say hey it's going you're, on. you're basing your you're basing your engagement with me on a number um, but what what i'm offering you is not the number or what i'm offering you is as an engaged audience and I think that's the conversation that that should happen, really. So the, the brands come direct to you, Brad, or you mentioned you had a team legally. How yep. do people approach you or what happens for that reach out? And again, following on from what Alex was just saying, are you finding that brands are very much saying we want a return on view here? It's got to be a guaranteed minimum view for a certain X amount of dollars or? Yeah. So you, the threshold. So I have a rep who who handles all those brand deals and then they set up like an email inbox. So if you email me, uh, occasionally I'll go in like once a week and just kind of sort through things to see if there's anything that goes in there. But for the most part, that's handled by them and they'll reply to all those and they'll send out my, my, um, like my number sheet and my specs and all that stuff. They've got a nice, uh, write up for my channel that we update every few months. So that's how that's handled. What they tell me is that once you average about 50,000 views per video, that's when you can start getting consistent. Like that's what brands are looking for, like 50,000 to 100. Th some are set at 100,000. So it kind of depends. So that's how I'm set up. Now, what's funny is this year, I think I've done four or five brand deals um, out of like 50 videos that I've done. So I have really taken a step back from brand deals just because my, my numbers aren't where they should be for a lot of brands. Um, I'm averaging probably 20 or 30,000 per video. Um, over time, they'll hit, they'll do well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and that first 30 days is kind of what they're looking for. And I'm just not hitting those numbers. So I'm just not getting those brand deals. So I'm pushing back and really relying more on my online courses and selling myself and my own products than brands this year, which is, mm -hmm. plus, is a plus and minus. I'm making less money this year. But it's, boy, it's liberating <laughs> if, if you can swing it. Yeah, I was just sharing with the guys um, a few days ago because, you know, in September and October is, is, you know, as we know in tech, it's the time of the year that you are going to get more money than the, the remainder of the year. It doesn't always work like that, but it's, you know, it's the potential is there. The budgets are, are there. Brands are reaching out more. Um, and, yeah, it's just if you are you know, smart with your time and your engagements, you, you will get more brand deals and more opportunities. The results though, I mean, I, 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 I'm not feeling <laughs> fresh, 
don't feel creative right now to to go and spontaneously create something that I will enjoy because I've been doing quite a lot of those brand deals. And, and as I was saying to the guys um, a few days ago, yeah, like you said, bro, I'm going to take a break from, especially from dedicated videos yeah. because they kind of push you towards making something that you don't necessarily, you know, you weren't necessarily planning. So you're doing it because obviously there's a studio to, you know, to pay the rent for, there's equipment, you got to, you know, try to make it as a business. The downside is too many of those can, can, can cause you to feel a little bit you know, less inspired to actually create. And um, so I'm, I'm also going to take a little bit of a step back, maybe create less videos, but look for the sponsor myself and say, right, I think for this video that I'm creating in a month's time, so I already know the video. And that's the exciting part of creating, I think. You, you kind of try to make the, the sponsor fit the video rather than the other way around. Because I found myself, especially in the last two months, m getting the brand deal first and then say, so how can I create a video that would make sense? And you end up just rushing and not doing a great job. And, you know, and it will feel like a break for the viewer. They will feel like, hang on, this, this thing doesn't make a lot of sense. So they'll skip. So no one's winning. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I um I want to come back to your courses a little bit, Brad. I'm very yeah, curious yeah. about the process of setting that up, but I just want to talk and just sort of quickly talk about this promote YouTube promote thing. I feel like whilst we talk about the creators a lot, we should really be talking about how that works at the back end from a YouTube sense. Like YouTube is happily accepting your money to promote your videos, knowing full well that long-term it's not doing benefits for your channel. And I think that's for me, I, I, I kind of, I probably shouldn't hate or sort of send hate towards the creator in that sense, because at the end of the day, the creators that are making it work for them are probably just doing it so they can provide for their family and they want to, you know, they're thinking about their ecosystem of people, like their kids, their family. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all doing things for. Whilst we all love what we do, we all also are trying to like, you know, I've got two young kids. I'm doing this full time at the moment. I have absolutely no inclination to hit that promote tab whatsoever. Like it's not my wheelhouse, but the, the other side of the coin is YouTube is putting it there and dangling it as a feature. And there's probably like coaches and courses saying, Hey, smash that button and use this if you can, because look at how well you could boost your channel. But I think YouTube needs to probably be transparent about how all of that stuff is being inserted into your channel, where these subscribers are coming, from. coming from. Why don't yeah. they engage mm. after, like if you get all of a sudden this influx of 3,000 subscribers from one video, if you make a similar video as your next video, why aren't those 3,000 subscribers either being served that video and why aren't they clicking on it? Like yeah. what's, what's the back end process? And I think there's not enough information about that and we probably – are sending our sort of questions towards the wrong people. We need to probably try and get more information off the other side of the coin. Um, that's just sort of where my head yeah. is kind of landing yeah. at this at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think transparency is the, is the key word there for me. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So is this, this sounds, I'm not quite as familiar with the promotions tab. It sounds like the Facebook model where Facebook's very like similar. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. It should have a very similar, you know, uh, their own business page. And then, once everybody had their own business page, they were like, okay, if you actually want to reach the people that liked your business, you have to pay us to reach them. Um, would, mm -hmm. That scares me a little bit uh, from a YouTube standpoint, where if it's going to become pay to play, yeah, that scares me a little bit, you know, because that kind of, one of the great things about the YouTube ecosystem is that a person like me can make it. Uh, but if the mm. business model then becomes, okay, they subscribe to you, but the best way to actually reach them is to pay, that's, that's I don't like it. Yeah. What gives me a, a little bit of hope is my other channel, my, my Brazilian channel, which every video I post, the engagement is just, you know, it actually makes me emotional when I, whenever I would go there and read the comments. It's like, oh my gosh. Unfortunately, the brand deals in Brazil are not going to pay for, for my, you know, I can't go full time based on that. But it gives me hope that if you create the content that matches the audience and they enjoy it and they engage with it, you know, there's no need to, to do anything artificially uh, mm -hmm. at the moment anyway. And there's plenty of proof out there, right? But if there's a shortcut, you can guarantee some people will, will exploit that. And 
it's it's I, I think YouTube should be transparent, but you know it, they are making money on it. Uh, like Daniel said, it's it's kind of a hard hard sell really to say. If, if I was watching a video that said, for example, even when it's if, even when we tag it as a paid promotion, you know that already puts some people off. Imagine yep. if you know one of my suggestions would be not only put it when it's paid promotion, but YouTube would automatically say this video is being boosted or something like that. Um, put a, some sort of a flag in there. They would never do it. But that yeah. to me would be the transparency model. That, okay, that if a creator chooses to do that as a, as a business model, yeah, fair enough. But at least the viewer would know uh, that even though it says 500,000 views, you know, maybe 20,000 of those views are, are real humans. The, other are, the others are just ads. It's uh, kind of interesting. I'm sure you guys know exactly what I mean, because judging on who's been listening or watching to this pod recently, it's a mixture of people that are thinking of starting channels or maybe just started channels are really interested in the nuts and bolts of making channels work. And obviously you three have had tremendous growth with your channels. But equally, once you're involved in the business, and I guess it's like anything, once you're involved and you begin to see the truth of what can go on, on the whole, the YouTube community, we've spoken beyond, between creators, you know, now having Matt Brad, I know for instance, I could reach out to him and say, oh, help me with this on an iPad. And we'd all help one another. I know that for sure. But equally, you know, there's a nefarious side to the business that other people are playing that before just as a viewer, and I used to sit down at a night, crack a beer and watch YouTube. It was just entertainment. And now you realize, of course, there's a hell of a business model behind it. And not everybody is running on the same sheet, which... Yeah, I suppose it's the, one of the few downsides. That, you know, you begin to take away that level of just pure escapism of being a YouTube watcher. Suddenly you're looking at everything as content and as RPM, CPM, metrics, retention, you know, yeah. blah, 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 blah. You know, even when I watch some of my favorite people that are not in the tech space and you just, you, you, you can just see it's coming like, the sponsors coming in any second now. You can just hear it in the intonation. And it's just a shame. And and I put out this, it's a you know, free video members newsletter idea. It's nothing really, but it's interesting. The feed, I mentioned this on that last week. And without any, without single exception, everyone said, stay true to what you're doing. Don't go the route of buying views. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people want that honesty. They want to feel that we're doing it the right way. And I know there is the possibility to do it the right way. And I guess longer term, it's going to have far greater benefits. Because, I mean, again, I've seen your comments, Brad. I mean, people get involved, heavily involved. I mean, Daniel, as soon as he puts up something to do with the, the really deep weeds of the OS on, on Samsung devices, people are all over it and want to know more. And that's the engagement that you want brands and sponsors to see, isn't it? They're real people that you've worked hard to get. I've got this one guy yeah. that hates the flip and the fold. And every time I make a video about the Z flip or the Z fold, he's on there calling it the flop because he just hates the flip <laughs> or he's there talking about the fold being an overpriced phone. And then the FE calls the fool's edition and he comments <laughs> not just himself, but underneath other people's comments oh, to gosh. just talk about how much he hates those phones. I but at least he's engaged. He's, at least engaged. he's engaged. He's a real, he's a real person. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to go back to these courses, Brad, yeah, because yeah, yeah. with myself being a Samsung only YouTuber, at least for now, I dive deep into Ooh, inside the products school. that, the products and the the way it works. No, I'm not. I'm not. I, I say that for now is like I leave myself open, but <laughs> it's a pretty closed door. Um, I go into the really nuances of the camera and the, the the settings and features that a lot of people don't dig up. I'm always thought, well, I think how to use Samsung phones could be a great course to start. I just I've got no idea where to sort of go or how to sort of begin that process. When you had that idea, where did you go to find? how to sort of start putting that together. So the first site I used was a site called Udemy. And that is, uh, that's basically a marketplace. And in a, a site like that, you lose a lot of control over a lot of things of your course, but you're exposed to a much larger audience. And that worked really well for me early on. Um, so the things you lose control over are pricing. Like you can price your course however you want, but they're going to run sales on it. So no one's going to pay the price that you list on there. Um, so I was averaging like $2 and 50 cents per course, but I was making it up in just quantity. You're also giving up. And this is the thing I probably regret the most is you can't access you. You can't access that audience. Um, you can, but you can't, you don't have their email addresses. So you have to use Udemy's platform to email them and promote things, which means you can't promote your YouTube videos because those are off platform. You can't promote any other courses that are off platform. 
So early on, that worked well for me because I was with a YouTube audience. I was able to break the Udemy algorithm. It's like an Amazon algorithm, which they the hot, the more your courses sell, uh, the higher they rank in Udemy's list. And so since I had a YouTube audience and most of the other people teaching on Udemy did not, I could then say, go check out my Procreate course. And then boom, I would be number one. And so even though I, then they were promoting it to, to their audience, it was turning up high in their search results. So that worked really well for me as a way to kind of break in early on. Once I got to a certain point, it was frustrating because you're like, I, you can only make it so far in this world, making $2 and 50 cents or $5 per course that is sold, you know? And so then, then I got to the point where I'm like, okay, now I'm going to put this on my own platform. So the first one I tried was one called Gumroad, um, which is solid. It's okay. It's geared more towards artists and people who are selling things like art assets and Photoshop brushes. A lot of people who sell iPhone backgrounds will use Gumroad. Yeah. It's, it's kind of geared towards that audience. They changed up how they did their payment system, which probably doesn't affect people on the low end, but I was doing in a volume that I was basically using their service for free. Like the first like few hundred dollars, they'd take a cut and then the next few hundred dollars. And once you got over like a few thousand uh, per month, they'd say, okay, you don't, you can use our platform for free. And then about two years ago, they changed that to just be a flat rate. Like they're taking a, I forget what the percentage was, but it didn't work for me anymore because I, I liked the tiered system. Um, mm -hmm. it probably works better for most creators. Uh, so that's one to check out right now. I'm using one called pay hip, um, which is okay. <laughs> um, I've, I've had mixed results with that. I don't think my, it's kind of dry. It's like the interface is just boring and I'm trying to make art interesting. So that's a silly reason not to like a platform, but that might be the reason <laughs> I end up leaving it eventually. Um, but that's working pretty well. Um, and then I have a Squarespace site and Squarespace has been rolling in like course integration in the last year or so. And so I'm thinking I might just move everything over to that and just run it all off my Squarespace site or put a course or two on there just to see how it does and see what kind of feedback I get from the people taking the mm -hmm. courses. And patrons, have you ever gone on the Patreon route? Or? I used it a little bit. Um, so what I discovered early on was that you can kind of spread yourself too thin. So I've always had this back and forth between doing affiliate marketing and selling my courses. And so when I promote my courses, the course sales go up and the affiliate sales go down. And then I'm like, oh, my affiliate sales are going down. So then I go back and I'd promote my affiliates because and the affiliate numbers would go up and the course numbers would go down. And so it was constantly this battle of what do you promote the most and Early on, I had Patreon for about a year, and it was another one of those things where it was like, okay, I'm going to promote the Patreon this week. So when I started selling courses, and especially when I moved them off of Udemy and started selling them on my own, the margins were better. And so it just made sense to kind of not do the Patreon thing, because when you do, you have to post there and you have to... It, like there's more upkeep. There was more upkeep than I was hoping. In my head, I thought this will be easy, I'll, you know, but uh, I decided not to. Um, I did turn on memberships last year at the request oh, of a YouTube rep. <laughs> Do you guys have, um, I forget what they're called, but someone, have you guys been reached out to by YouTube yet with someone to kind of walk you through features and things like that? I think you I have, have recently, yeah, not, um, not at the beginning, but after, I think after across the hundred K subs, they, yeah, the, the partner program, someone said, yeah. yeah, and they keep bugging me to, to turn it on. And I got as far as being approved. I got all the perks in there. I just personally don't feel is, is another commitment. Right. And I'm struggling yep. as it is to, because if, if I, if I'm selling something, I'd like people to feel that they're getting something back. And, I, and at the moment, I think I would struggle to say for my uh, you know, for people who are getting that early access or whatever it might be, I feel that they'll be, they'll be a little bit shortchanged. Um, but yeah, that, they're, they're pushing me to do it because I think they take, is it 30% or is it like yeah. a 70, 30 yeah. deal? So obviously, yep. yeah, it's in their benefits for you to do it. Do you, talking of the memberships um, and that area of the business, 
Do you guys, do you ever suffer from uh, imposter syndrome? Uh, in, by that I mean, why would anyone be interested in me? Why would anyone want to buy a... Oh, you immediately nodded. So you, <laughs> I mean, I'm not that point yet. I'm thinking down the road there could be something I could do, but I'm thinking, why would anyone want to listen to me? Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a constant battle. <laughs> Is it? Because, yeah. you know, so I'm not there yet, but it's interesting hearing about your courses. I know with Alex speaking about memberships and so on, there's, there's clearly roots there. And we've, we've established early in the conversation that, yeah, we love what we're doing, but equally we're trying to make a, a, a buck or two along the way as well. And clearly if you can create something like memberships or courses, that's another revenue stream. But you just got to have that belief that you're good enough. Yeah, that I, man, I've struggled and I've talked about it on YouTube. So when I started my channel, I was not an illustrator. I was a, I was a UX designer and so I was learning illustration as I went and pretty early on and the comment, I still get it to this day, less so, um, because I've gotten better, uh, but like early on, man, people were brutal about my art cause I'm drawing on these things and talk about imposter syndrome. Like I'm reviewing a drawing tablet and I suck at drawing. Uh, and so it was one of those things where I like, very, I think early on, I very publicly, like I made a video talking about it. I was like, I love this. Like, this is fun, but I'm not good at it. And I need to be better at it if this is going to be my career. And I just brought the audience along with me. Mm. And then the early things I taught were the software, because I thought, who wants to buy a drawing class from a guy who can't draw, <laughs> you know? And so early on, I did do that the like the software route where it's like I can teach Procreate, I can teach Adobe Illustrator, I can teach this stuff and give you kind of the basics where you can kind of take it from there. And it's just it was last year that I launched my intro to my like my learn to draw in 60 days class is what it's called. And that was a huge step for me because I was like, OK, I think I'm good enough to pull this off now, but also I very much target this class to beginners. So like, I'm very honest about where I am in my journey of becoming an artist and like, yeah, I've gotten better and I've gotten better using these techniques. And, and the one thing I noticed going online and trying other people's tutorials, cause I've gotten sponsorships from people who sell like high end art tutorials. And when I took some of those, like I was way in over my head. I would like some of these fundamental drawing anatomy courses, uh, figure drawing courses, Holy cow, they were great, but they're college level courses. And I'm like an elementary school level <laughs> artist at this point. And so it, it took some time for me to get to the point where I was actually comfortable teaching the art part of it. But then, but just kind of being in that space and doing that stuff, I realized, oh, I had a hard time with these high end courses. But if I can introduce these concepts early, people can learn this stuff. But a lot of that just kind of comes from doing it and being in the trenches and doing the videos. And that's one of the most, that's one of the coolest things about YouTube is that you're getting that constant feedback and you are like by making a video, you're getting comments from people asking questions specific. Sometimes it's about art. Sometimes it's about tech, but that leads you down paths you otherwise wouldn't go down. Mm. And I think that's kind of what makes you a professional in tech is not so much knowing about tech at the beginning, but what you're learning as you're trying to explain it to other people and the questions mm -hmm. you're getting asked. Yeah. And I noticed that with your content, cause it's always fresh as well, because you, you're always bringing something. I mean, I remember reaching out to you when I, I, I had no idea about procreate and how he uses memory on the iPad. And I remember asking, you know, yeah. and you kind of explained to me about the 4k canvases and the limits that there are and how that uses memory. And it's still to, to this day, whenever I talk about Procreate and how he uses memory on the iPad, I refer to, to you because, you know, it's one of those things. But uh, what I also notice is that you, you, you're you learning about 3D stuff as well, right? You, you're yeah, kind of dabbling with... that's fine. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good lesson for, for anyone in this space, really, because tech is always moving, tech is always changing. And the benefit for creators is there's always something new. And, and if we're, you know, if we kind of allow ourselves the headspace to go learn something is always going to make our content a little bit better. And um, mm -hmm. now it's great. To, and you're a great example of that. Yeah. It's funny because 
part of me chases my own interests and part of me chases views, right? And there's always this battle between those two things. And the 3D art is like definitely chasing my own interests. But over the light earlier this year, the kind of first half of this year, I was getting a lot of views, basically hating on AI. Um, it's trained on generative AI. A lot of these models are trained on artists' work without those Adobe the permission. <laughs> yeah, and and there's a lot of people with different opinions. My opinion is it's copyrighted work, and if you have to build a product on copyrighted work, you should be able you should license that work if it's a yeah. commercial product. That's that's kind of my take in a nutshell. Um, but there's a lot of news around that and a lot of stuff. And early in the year, I did a lot of videos about it, stuff Adobe was doing, stuff other people were doing, covering some of the lawsuits that are going through the courts here in the States. Um, but I had to stop kind of, I hit a wall this summer where I was like, this isn't fun. Like this sucks. Like I know there's views here and I can make money here, but covering this stuff, like it's draining and it's not like the comments are harsh and they weren't geared towards me. Like the mean comments were not pointed towards me, but just reading mm -hmm. that negativity, following that stuff. I still up. To, it's part of the industry. It's, it's a moving story. It's something I'm going to cover, but I realized like earlier this year, I was chasing views and it was hurting. Like it was bad for my, you know, mental, I, I don't like to say mental health because I like I don't have mental health problems that, you know, but it's a, kind of an overused term. Uh, but it, mm. it's, you know, it puts you in yeah, a bad happiness. Mood. Yeah. 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 My own happiness. That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Mm. I like That's that example and story. Cause I started my whole channel on like being positive towards Samsung. Mm -hmm. And I often get accused of being too positive. And I think for me, I far enjoy being excited about the Samsung features and, I'm excited to tell other people about it. And I find whenever I do like a negatively slightly angled video, yeah, the views, like I did a video called what's wrong with the S24 ultra. And in fact, the video actually was more in defense of it, but the angle that it was coming from was that there's a lot of negative connotations around it. And I just, I didn't like that that was successful because I had like the idea of being positive towards the S24 ultra, but sometimes you've got to, sometimes you do have to play the view game but it's just, it's just sucks that you have to, you know, yeah, it sucks that yeah. that's the, that sort of gets response when ultimately mm -hmm. I just want to be excited. That's all I want to do. I, I, I took a cue from that a couple of weeks ago as well, because it's weird in the Apple space, although the people that buy into Apple are very, very, very loyal. Also I've noticed they really like to come down on them super hard. And it's what you're just saying, Daniel, about the fun thing. I thought all of these devices are great. Yes, there might be. Odd. And I, I was just watching one of your uh, videos before we came on, Brad, where you were saying, look, I review these tablets. It's my job to find fault with them. But equally, <laughs> you went on to say, they're good. Yeah. If you want the, if you want the carry away, they're, they're both good. And it's kind of when I saw Daniel really enjoying Samsung, I thought, geez, we need to do more of that. We need to actually just say, yeah, okay, there might be the odd little needle here and there that's not brilliant. But overall, you're getting something that's pretty damn neat to use. And it's that fun thing. And, you know, when you said that it wasn't, yes, there was views in talking about Adobe and the way they're going back into history of every image that we've uploaded and using that for AI bots to learn and then do your artists out of trade because clearly, you know, generative AI is being taught from somewhere. Um, yeah, we do need to just, it is entertainment and we need to be, have fun ourselves doing it as mm. well, because otherwise if we sit in a room by ourselves for long enough, if we're talking turgid stuff, to it, we don't want to be doing it. So it's a, it's a one way street, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Now Brad, so, it's a tech podcast. What phone yes. do you use? I have, <laughs> I have an iPhone 15. Beautiful. Or no, and I'm what's sorry, sort of... iPhone 13. I'm old. Oh, 13. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. Going back. And what's years. just. What's your sort of like gear setup for like not, not just editing, but like in general, like what do you sort of surround yourself with as your daily sort of products that you like to use? Uh, there uh, we go. It's right behind you. So um, I have like, th this is starting to show up on my channel. Talk about kind of chasing your hobbies. Um, I've always been a Mac guy, but, but with everything, like the more you use, like the more you use Samsung, the more you start to appreciate the nuances of what they're doing. And the more you use Windows, the more you start to appreciate Windows. And I went hard into um, building a Windows PC last year around this time. 
Um, I was trying to get a sponsorship to get Asus to pay for it. I was this close, but I, I failed at the last second, but I was like, dang it, I want a gaming PC. And so I ended up building it. Um, part of it is that I love aesthetically beautiful things and computer cases in the last few years are getting really awesome. Mm. Like they're just doing some really interesting things. They're not just RGB everywhere and, you know, metal and funky shapes. Um, so now we're getting this really cool thing. So, uh, so I am now like Windows based. I'm talking to you on a Mac laptop, full disclosure. But like mm -hmm. my day to day is Windows. Um, I'm drawing on an iPad. That's kind of my primary thing. But I'm also kind of drawing on whatever I have. So if I'm reviewing something, I'm probably drawing on that. Um, so a lot of that stuff flows in and out. So yeah, I guess my main setup is PC, um, iPhone usually ipad but sometimes sometimes it's it's all over the place um so so yeah the thing that floats around tends to be my drawing tablet the other stuff tends to be stuck you're a smartwatch user i have an i i watch or no apple watch but i i just <laughs> that never the remember, not <laughs> yeah i never remember to put it on that's my problem yeah yeah and I never I remember to charge, so it's always dead. Oh my, so I'm, the Garmin kind of gets me around for weeks without <laughs> without that problem. So. And I guess just briefly before we, we round off, uh, there was a release this week of the iPad. I mean, I know, Daniel, obviously you didn't get your hands on that one, but the three of us, I know, have been using it. Um, quick sentence or two on, on our findings. Alex, do you want to go first? You go first. I've got a motorbike downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my carry away was uh, I was new to iPads this year in general. I bought my first iPad Pro in the summer, the M4. Really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm working, making sure that I don't compare the Mini to the Pro. Very different beasts, very different user cases. From what I've seen of it so far, it's kind of okay for what it does. Outside, I'm surprised how dim it is. Um, other than that, it's kind of as a, a quick device for looking at some news on catching up on your messages on i was just watching youtube before come so it's, uh, yeah it, but it's it's not i think in a sentence it needs to try to not be what it's not the the ipad mini is possibly the cleanest definition of what an ipad perhaps was in steve jobs mind if we want to go back to those days and i think it fits that bill very well whether it should ever be thought of as a, a mini production tool or not i'm not sure yet i need to spend longer with it would kind of be my thoughts yeah, I found I found more problems than positives on that one. I mean, it's 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 a lovely. It's my first iPad Mini, so if I ignore everything else, like I said, it's a lovely device. It's great to just hold it and take notes and do the odd scribble and read the news or whatever it might be. But it's you know I always look at the screen and go, hang on, this doesn't feel like a a brand new Apple device. You know, it's whenever you buy Apple, at least for me. You kind of expect a premium experience, even though this is the budget, the cheapest iPad. Uh, so I think that they missed the mark a little bit on, on the display. If the display doesn't need too much here, if the display was better on this device, I probably would have paid even up to five or fifty, six, six hundred. But mm. th there's a lot to be said about just something slightly bigger than the iPhone and smaller than the iPad, you know, for chilling on the couch. I mean, I love the fold because of that. Um, so I knew I would like the form factor, but the display, every time I, I, I look at it and go, hang on, my eye, my eyes feels like I'm back in 2017 or something. <laughs> I see a fold. Oh, I got fold yeah. And Brad, your takeaway on it? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious, Alex, about the display. Are you used, like the iPad you held out, was that the smaller iPad Pro? That's the iPad mini. Yeah, that's the iPad mini. Oh, you held up the mini. Okay. I thought that was, yeah. yeah I. I came prepared with visual aids as well. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, the display didn't bother me too much. Um, it's definitely like sitting next to an iPad pro, like it's night and day. Um, but mm. by itself, it didn't really bother me that much. Um, I thought it looked good. Drawing on it is fun because it's like so cute. Like it's just this tiny little portable thing. When I was drawing like larger, stuff i did miss the real estate which is the first time that's happened on an ipad that happens on mm. windows drawing tablets that i use all the time because the interface clutter just takes over the screen and then your drawing area is tiny 
Whereas this, even in like procreate, the stuff kind of stays out of the way. Um, mm. But I did enjoy it. And this kind of goes to the hobby thing. So I did my review, but I got a lot of questions on my last iPad mini about gaming on it. Like, I think it's like younger mm. people who are like, yeah. how does Minecraft run it? How does this run on it? So when we get off this call, I'm going to post my new video. It's in the member yeah. section right now. I picked this up, which is wide enough to fit the iPad mini and basically turn it into like a gaming machine. So I was playing, I got, I re-upped to Apple Arcade and I've been playing all these like Apple Arcade games that I haven't played in a while. And mm. I've been having a lot of fun. Um, just normal games. I was playing Genshin Impact with the controller. I've played that game before, but I didn't enjoy it because it's got like the touch controls. Mm. I can stream from my PC to this thing, which is amazing. Like, Right. when my network works it's amazing <laughs> that's a big if <laughs> uh, so like i have found so i'm really taken by this device but not for the reasons that i thought i would be it's just kind of i've gone off on this tangent and i've learned to love it in a completely different way because it's just did you have a, the previous cool. one what's that did you have the previous one was this your first mini as well I did have the previous one. It was also on loan from Apple. So I only had it for a few months, um, okay. but I didn't really use it. It was uh, like I reviewed it. I tested it and then I didn't, I, I had the pro. And so that was my main drawing device. So I just never went back to it. Um, that's usually the sign of a good device. Like if you finish the review and then you go back to it, shout out to the Samsung galaxy ultra family uh, tab ultra family. Cause that's one where you just, I look at it and I'm like, I really want to use that. Yeah. Like, I got to find a reason to use that. Yeah. yeah. Mine, I still have the <laughs> S9 note. It sits. It's interesting. Uh, that you, you mentioned, though, that you actually found fun using it. Not necessarily what you intended, but you, that's the thing. When you kind of review something, you forget that, oh, hell, we can actually just use this for what it was intended for. And you suddenly found this whole other area to use it for gaming. Yeah. Just to switch off from your day job, switch off at night, and just enjoy yourself with it. Yep. Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I don't usually about... do this, but in defense of Apple, like, what else does the iPad mini need to be? Like, of like, what else does it have to be? When you think about an iPad mini audience, it's mm. someone who doesn't, who wants an inexpensive Apple tablet and they're just going to use it to browse the internet, do a bit of light social media, like that's, and watch some entertainment. And yes, everything, one of those things can be improved by a better display, 120 hertz refresh rate, um, lesser bezels, more powerful processor, all that can be improved. But if they're selling in the format they are, it's almost like, well, why do Apple need to really do much more? Like mm. that's that's in defense of them. You won't find me defending them too much, but that's just no, in you, defense. Exactly. They've got the pro for that, haven't they? You know, they've clearly defined where they think the, the mini should sit. And there's all these clamors regularly for an iPad mini pro. And I just I, I just don't, I think that's making a pastiche of what it is. It's never was designed. I have my iPad mini pro right here. <laughs> <laughs> you, have you ever used a foldable Brad? iPad mini pro <laughs> <laughs> have you ever used the foldable i have i have uh the galaxy fold from three years ago i don't know if it was the second or the third one the first um, one with the s pen yes yeah yes yeah, yeah. that, makes sense. that was you fun uh it was cool it wasn't it's not great for drawing because when you have that bump in the middle like mm. that's the main place where you're drawing with the pen and that sort of thing and so like just having that little divot there it's just not good for creating illustrations unless you're just mm. trying to, if you're out and about, I guess, mm. and you just want to get an idea down. I also have a um, mm -hmm. galaxy note before the note became the ultra. Um, and that works just as well for that sort of thing. Yep. Mm. Exactly. Oh, you have got a, is that the seven? That is the seven. I bought it this <laughs> week cause I was, I missed it so much from not having it. I remember Aww. returning it and being upset. So I was like, well, I'm in a position where I can buy it now. And so I, so I did. I bought one. Yeah. So you said you're just about to upload another video as soon as we finished recording, didn't you, Brad? Yeah. It's called Gaming on the iPad Mini. I don't know how it's going to do. My, It's not my core audience thing. Um, but it was one of those... I. Yeah, and so I, it just became part of that review and I got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and I tested like, I was having fun. So I tested a lot of stuff and I thought, you know, I've got, <laughs> you know, an hour of footage of B-roll 
and I could just talk about my experience but, yeah, and just yeah, yeah. splice it together. So it and took me a half fun. a day. Exactly. I did all the hard work and it wasn't hard. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, I did all the work and I thought, and splice it together and see what happens. Make a video. Yeah. Throw yeah. it out there. It's still a hot topic. Really, People are still know. clicking on it. So maybe it'll do okay. I don't know. I think it'll do well. Yeah. I found quite interesting as well in the comments. People are saying that the corporate space is, is where they sell a lot of iPad minis as well. Mm -hmm. like, I hadn't thought about it, but it makes a mm. lot of sense for scanning documents in the field, like field technicians and uh, healthcare people. Personal yeah, it makes, trainers. It makes too. a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, it, again, like you, I didn't know it was your first one, Alex, but it's the first one I've I've bought. And um, mm. yeah, so far, it, I, I always have to remind myself, as you just mentioned, actually, Brad, to go back and use these things. Because you tend to make your view, do your B-roll, then it sits on a desk and you move on to other things. And you think, oh, hell, actually, I've got that to go and use. And of course, you know, I've spent my own money on it. I've bought it. It's mine. I'm not doing that whole 14-day return thing because I really don't fully agree with that. Where, yeah. The fun in these things comes in using them a few months down the line. I think, oh, actually, it's decent and you'll suddenly find things that it's good at that you didn't initially recognize or realize it was aimed at so and that's part of the fun of owning these things totally. um, I, and i think next week's going to get expensive for me because there's mac minis coming out which is something <laughs> and macbook pros as well <laughs> macbook pros yeah i'm more interested yeah. in mac minis actually i think i'm going to try and get myself a, i've never heard of mac mini but i think the new m4 pro mac mini could be quite a beast um, so I think we're running quite long on this one, boys. We've all got things to do. Daniel, sleep. Um, <laughs> it's all good. And find a camera. I'm okay. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's my microphone. Daniel left okay. the building? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. The building. Okay. Uh, Brad, thank, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. we really great meeting with you. Yeah, it's it great. Bad. Thanks for having me. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time. And for everybody that watched and listened to the last episode and was kind enough to subscribe and help this pod to grow, thank you so we much. Really 300. Does. Thank you. I know. It means yeah. the world to us. And that last one, suddenly we were watching it in real time. Ah. It was just view, 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 view. So, yeah, I hopefully you've enjoyed the conversation we're having this time. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks' time with the next Minus 16 with another guest and with more behind-the-scenes talk about what it's like running a channel here on YouTube. So, until then, thank you so much for watching and listening. And we'll catch you very, very soon. Cheers, boys.